welcome to our panel on uh, how to use technology and alternative data. Um, well, I am Ruben Falk. I'm with uh, Amazon Web Services. I spent 20 years in capital markets, um, on the buy side, on the sell side, and with S&P Global Market Intelligence, where I led uh, the investment management solutions business for 10 plus years. Um, so looking forward to this panel, and uh, welcome to my esteemed guests. And uh, why don't we start by doing a round of introductions. So, uh, so Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah McKenna. I'm with Sequentum. We have a point-and-click low-code automation platform for web data extraction. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Brian Peltonen. I'm Director of Data Analytics at Fidelity Investment. And I am responsible for, uh, my team is responsible for supporting our equity analysts and portfolio managers um, using alternative data and AI to help them with their investments. Good morning. Uh, my name is Samantha Teal. I'm with the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board. Uh, I'm a director of innovation in our alpha generation lab. So our team is charged with developing, incubating, and then sending back out into the organization new investment strategies, primarily using data and technology. And I'm Ben Zweig, uh, CEO of Revelio Labs. So Revelio Labs is a workforce data company. So anything and everything related to employment, we're all over that. All right, great, thank you. So um, let's start out. So over the last, say, three years or so, you know, the, the themes for investment managers have been rapidly changing. As someone mentioned, you know, we were talking about uh, Trump's trade war with China in 2019. I haven't heard about that much for a little while. And then we had COVID and post-COVID, and now we've got, you know, Ukraine and, and oil at, at 110 and food inflation and so forth. So, you know, that's just in three years. So as a, as a producer and a consumer, of alternative data and uh, an employer of the technology needed to extract value from that data, you know, how do you adjust and how do you become sort of efficient in, in this sort of rapidly changing environment in terms of sourcing data and producing insights and producing the data in the first place for those who are in, in that uh, situation? Why don't we go around the horn, start with you, Sarah. Well. As I mentioned, we have a low-code platform. It's enterprise software. Um, it's point-and-click efficiency for creating agents to pull data from any source, whether it's a web page, a document, a database, or an API. Uh, we can enrich that data using process automation, using any um, AI enrichment, uh, sentiment scoring, or translation. Um, and then we can package up, format, and deliver the data to any endpoint. Um, so this is a very efficient process, but you need to be very careful um, with the speed to market with this data because you need to make sure that you're not um, overstepping any uh, compliance risks, rules, any guidelines that you may have established for your, your operation. Um, so we also supply um, transparency into the data operation, um, permissions, controls, audit logs, and governance. Um, for the full operation. All right, thank you. I think your, your question is a, a great one. You know, if we, we look at the past three years, um, it, it's really unfolded in a different way than um, certainly any prediction or forecast that I had seen. Um, the, the only certainty I think we have is that, you know, 18 months from now, the issues we're gonna be dealing with are not ones that are at the forefront of our minds today. And so the question is, how can you be familiar with the data and techniques that are out there to, um, to adapt quickly and respond to whatever the issues may be. And I think a large part of that is meeting with a lot of, of vendors, having a lot of familiarity of what's out there, and being ready to act quickly um, when events unfold differently from how you would have, uh, how you would have guessed. I think uh, as a pension plan, we have a unique perspective here because we are a very long horizon investor. And so while you might want to kind of look and understand what's happening over the next couple of years, we're really looking at how our asset's going to perform over 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, so I think we're, we're trying to understand what is the regime shift we're going through right now? Um, what is it most akin to? Though we realize things are going to be, I think, quite different, um, and this might be unlike anything we've ever seen before. And then what are the new types of data or new sources of data we can and should be ingesting to try and, and, and bubble up relevant themes? Um, so one big focus we've had recently has been on uh, more qualitative textual data. 
So enhancing our NLP skills such that we can really in ingest the wealth of data that is currently not being used in pricing markets um, and, and hoping to understand how that's going to impact the world going forward. Yeah, I think it's a great question. And in some ways, I think we've gotten kind of lucky. Um, you know, the last recession, the 0809 crisis, was a financial crisis. And a lot of, there have been a lot of financial crises in, uh, you know, throughout history. There have not been a lot of labor market shocks. And this is the first recession that I can remember where it was really spurred by a labor market shock. And, um, and I think that has disrupted labor markets everywhere. You know, there's, there were labor shortages, there was a great resignation, there's new ways of working. So I think the macro environment this time around is very, very labor market centric. You know, that's, that's what everyone's talking about, that's what everyone's thinking about. But I think, you know, who knows what's gonna happen in the future. I don't imagine there will be, you know, more labor market shocks. But, you know, on the micro level, um, you know, every, every firm is constantly thinking about how to manage their, their own workforce, how to adapt to a new macro environment. So I think, you know, the way, the way to adapt, the way to stay agile is just find, you know, what, what you're good at, what you're looking at, and, uh, and try to find some linkages to whatever the macro environment is. You know, even the geopolitical um, topics, you know, there's, there's ways to get at that from web scrape data, from employment data, from NLP, from all these, all these different processes. So, um, yeah, I think, I think there's ways to be adapted. Great. Um, and, and when it comes to NLP and machine learning and you know, artificial intelligence more, more generally, I mean, how, how much is that employed in extracting value from alternative data? Is it in the data preparation phase? Is it in the forecasting phase? Is it, you know, more sort of standard techniques like your random forest SD boost, or is it sort of more advanced techniques like neural net and knowledge graphs were brought, was brought up in the last conversation? Where are we with using machine learning in, in capital markets and, and when it comes to, to alternative data, you know, specifically? And I'll, maybe I'll start with you, Brian, and then anybody who wants to, to add in. Uh, it's it's used all over the place. Um, you know, a lot of times it's uh, you know we'll we'll use it for um, forecasting, but more importantly, when dealing with large data sets, trying to distill it, trying to clean it, trying to extract um, trying to extract information from it, um, that, that tends to be where most of the advanced um, techniques that we're using. It's in that kind of unglamorous phase of things. Um, in terms of forecasting, uh, oftentimes um, there isn't the amount of data needed to, um, to, to train um, the most sophisticated models. You know, if we're dealing with something like um, quarterly KPIs on thousands of companies and a data set only goes back a few years, it gets hard to train models that really like um, many millions of of entries for training sets, um, but I, I would say the the answer is uh, it uh, broadly applied and in every phase of the process. Right. Anybody else wants to add to that? Sh sure. Yeah. So I think in what we do, NLP is a huge part of of understanding workforce data. You know, a lot of this comes from LinkedIn profiles, job postings, Glassdoor reviews. There's so much free text in all of this. So I think the, the issues are not really in supervised learning. It's not so much can you predict this labeled outcome. You know, a little bit of a hot take, but I think supervised learning is getting a little bit commoditized. It's not really where, where the, the true value in machine learning is. It's, it's really in structuring the data so that it can be used in a nice, neat, tabular way. So if you see you know, tens of millions of unique job titles, what are you gonna do with that? You know, you, we can't give that to a hedge fund and say, here, go play with this and have fun. You know, we need to categorize things to a fixed number of occupations, to a fixed number of seniority levels. This is just work that it wouldn't make sense for any investment manager to do that on their own. So getting, getting from a point of raw, unstructured, free text to a nice, neat data set that anyone can embed in a traditional analytics workflow takes a lot of 
unsupervised learning. You know, you need to create taxonomies, embeddings of words, job titles, skills, um, and you need to use that to create mappings to even uh, company IDs. Um, so there's so much NLP and machine learning that, that goes in under the hood, but at the end of the day, you wanna deliver something that looks like a structured data set. Right, I was, I was gonna say something similar. So the new field that's emerged, right, in trying to make sense of all of this data when you're applying machine learning in NLP is ML ops, machine learning operations. And, you know, one of the big thought leaders in the space, Andrew Yang, has a big focus on data-centric models instead of model-centric models, right? When, the, when, the, when this practice first emerged, uh, teams were trying to figure out how to make this work. They were dealing with very large, uh, noisy data sets and they were tweaking the model as they went along, right? And we've seen that, uh, you know, with other data vendors, right, you can't tweak the model. You have to, you have, to have a model that is, uh, you know, it has to be clear. It ha people need to know what's happening, right? You can't keep changing things over time. What you need is a really data-centric approach to clean, clean, clean data sets that are purpose-built, right? So just like you said, like, you don't want to give them you know, soup to nuts, the whole lake of data that you have, you want to give them exactly the data that they need to get to the answer to their question, right? And they'll use, they'll apply machine learning on top of that and they'll apply NLP, but if they don't have that core data set clean and they know exactly at the provenance and how it was generated, then, you know, you really, the, the, the value becomes, uh, it gets lost. Right. It's really important to have the ML operation you know, yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'll, I'll say from, you know, the perspective of AWS, I mean, certainly we're seeing use cases around, you know, structuring unstructured data, be it text or otherwise. I mean, another use case we're seeing is in the high frequency space, right, where, mm -hmm. say, if you have an order book, you, you know, down to the millisecond or whatever it may be, I mean, that, that there is so much data there, right, that you can actually, it's sort of a, a fertile ground for, machine learning algorithms and, and sort of, you know, deep learning type type approaches. Um, all right, just on the on on just on the data specifically, maybe this is for you, Ben, and, and talking about sort of the macroeconomic environment right now. I mean, what you know, you're seeing all this employment data. Um, what what what's it telling us? Because you know, it's it's uh, you look at some data, it looks things look pretty bearish. You look at other data, we seem like we, we're sort of chucking along. What, what does it look like from your perspective, given the insights you have? Yeah, from a labor market perspective, things look pretty bullish. So um, we're seeing we're seeing a bit of a, a bit of a divergence between what's happening in asset markets and what's happening in the real economy. And so, w what I mean by that is like you know we even had in in Powell's speech last week that you know we're seeing we're seeing rising aggregate demand and a very inelastic supply. So labor markets are restricted. We, we still have not fully recovered to the labor force participation that we'd seen pre-pandemic. So there's restrictions there, but also we're seeing record high job listings, record high demand for labor, and record low layoffs. Even though we've seen some high profile layoffs happening in tech and in crypto, I think that, that just, you know, in, in, the, in the rest of the economy, layoffs are at an all-time low. And I think that sort of underscores this point in a way that in the more speculative markets that are more linked to assets, um, we're, seeing, we're seeing demand pull back considerably. But of course, you know, the, the Fed has their dual mandate and wouldn't be, you know, uh, taking such an aggressive uh, stance on, on their forward guidance if, it, if they didn't feel like we were close to full employment, and if there was some some flexibility there, so I think we're feeling very optimistic about labor markets. And uh, of course, that's not all around. You know, some markets are doing better than others, and we can see, you know, wage inflation um, by every job. And actually, any uh, anyone want to guess what job is seeing the the highest wage inflation? Anyone from the audience? Data scientist. Not data scientist, mm -hmm. I wish. 
What? Fast food truckers. No, it's actually recruiters. And yeah, I think that's such an, it's, it's like kind of a funny job because it's a little meta in a way where when, when the demand for recruiters increases, that implies optimism about hiring more people in the future. So I think that that sort of supports this point that companies themselves are feeling like they will be facing more and more tight labor markets in the future. Great, thank you. Um, all right, so, so Sam, I'm gonna to turn to you a little bit now. So the, you know, in our prep call, we talked about this concept of uh, secure multi-party computation and access to private data through encryption and essentially being able to access data for purposes of you know, alpha signals that otherwise would have been considered too sensitive, too private, not disclosable, um, which, which to me sounded like you know, that could be sort of a treasure trove of new data that could be uncovered uh, with that approach. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what you're doing in that space and what you think the potential is and how far along you are and you know, how far along you think the industry is because uh, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of a fascinating new, new topic. Thanks, Ruben. Uh, this is something I could talk about quite a bit. <laughs> um, so in, in a world where most data is being used by investors is becoming more and more commoditized and is being kind of priced into the markets, investors are really looking for what are going to be new, unique data sources that others don't have access to. No matter how much you're looking at commercial data markets and acquiring new data sources, the alpha that you can generate from those data sources will eventually decay as others start to use it as well. What we've been exploring is how can you use technology, so specifically SMPC and other forms of kind of encryption and cryptography, to enable access to derive insights from new data sources. So companies that have treasure troves of data that they're not comfortable selling right now, whether it's for commercial reasons, for privacy reasons, for reputational reasons, you can use this technology to actually uh, train and, and run your models on data sources that would otherwise be inaccessible. Now, if you think about the way that privacy regulations are starting to expand, uh, and we're moving in North America a little bit closer to some of the regulations you, you might see in Europe, like GDPR, there is actually more interest in protecting security of data while also uh, enabling insight. So what we've done is actually partner with a company in the SNPC space, a company called uh, Infer, to try and build a, a network of data providers uh, that otherwise would not be able to monetize their data um, and use that to feed into our models. It's very early, honestly, in the asset management space. Um, we've seen a lot of traction in this space when it comes to healthcare data uh, and, and banking use cases, where there's really incentive to share data with your peers uh, for things like better patient outcomes or even uh, anti-fraud models. But for asset managers, where everyone's a little bit more protective of their models, of their data, it's harder to align incentives. Um, and so I think it's a little bit earlier stage for us, but we're hoping to be at the forefront of that. Great. Is that something anybody else is seeing at, at, at Fidelity, anywhere else? This, this uh, you know, secure multi-party computation approach to private data? I mean, we are aware of partners that do this, like Triple Blind. Um, they've, they're you know, at all the same conferences and working with our customers. Um, mm -hmm. We have a lot of customers in the healthcare space, not just in finance. Um, so it is certainly a, a, a use case for them. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to come back to it in a, in a second. But, but before that, I, I want to introduce another sort of um, topic or concern, if you will, which is, you know, as, as probably you all know, App Annie had this enforcement action against them last year uh, by the SEC because they were using data that wasn't fully disclosed as, as, as the data that it actually was, right? And so alternative data providers are becoming, you know, they're facing more scrutiny now and, and due diligence requirements are increasing and, you know, they're, they're maybe they have to have a certain scale to have a, a you know, a legal counsel on board and so forth. It, is that something that, that yours, is that something that's changing the market for how alternative data is provided and, and consumed? And what, what's the sort of repercussions of that that you've seen so far, if, if any? Why don't we start with you, Sarah? Yeah, I mean, Sequentum, Sequentum has worked uh, over 18 months on compliance uh, guidelines. We published uh, under the Alt Data Council 
um, with FISD, the Financial Information Standards Division under SIA, um, guidelines on how to operate a web data operation with compliance. And we think quite a bit about how to um, operate in this unregulated space um, in, a, in a governed way um, and in a way that, you know, SEC governed institutions can really align around. Um, the interesting thing for us as a data vendor, um, you know, in the wake of the app ante decision was that uh, data vendors are indeed SEC governed, right? It was, you know, in 2018, 2019, um, you know, in, dis in discussing, you know, contracts with uh, compliance teams of SEC governed firms, um, they would always say, well, you're not SEC governed, um, so you're, you carry less risk. But apparently we are SEC governed, and that's quite clear now. The issue with App Annie um, was that they, <clears throat> they had two sides to their business. Right? They had the side of the business that, where they ran models on aggregated data, and it was supposed to be anonymized aggregated data, an automated machine learning process that spit out certain forecasts. But in trying to get those models to work well, they looked at their other side of the business, which was actual real company data, um, which was material non-public information. And they used that to inform their models. And so their models were you know, remarkably accurate. Um, and so the firms that were trading on that data were, technically you could say it was insider trading, but because they had gone through a very concrete, um, responsible due diligence process, they expected it to be aggregated, anonymized um, uh, answers being spit out, and it wasn't. So in, in that case, again, from Sequentum's point of view, we're laser focused on compliance, we're constantly building improvements uh, in our platform to make sure that we have uh, compliant and governable operation. One of the things that we focus on is not just establishing operating guidelines that are auditable, but providing the transparency to all the teams who are stakeholders in making sure that that operation is working the way it needs to, right? So we automatically document every automation routine. We call them agents. Um, they're automatically documented. You can see all the version history. You can see, you know, all the schedules and deployments, what went where, who had access, who made what change when, right? And then at any time that there is an issue associated with an agent, there's a ticketing system and there are issues tracked. Um, and this is all, you know, transparent. And there's controls, right? There's things like rate limits and there's an approval process. Um, you know, there's a compliance role. Someone can, um, you know, control what's allowed and not allowed to run, um, you know, and these are all what we think of as, as best practices. Obviously, this is an unregulated unre space. We're getting more and more decisions, like the HiQ LinkedIn decision um, went the way we expected it to, right? Web scraping is not um, uh, something that is a uh, hacking under the CFAA. That was an important um, decision uh, to reach. Um, web scraping is not on its own illegal, right? There are things that you can do during web scraping that can get you into trouble. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think App Annie was, uh, uh, you know, made it clear that, that data vendors are also SEC governed right. and need to take compliance very seriously. Right, right. And that fidelity, has, has things changed since the App Annie decision with respect to how you engage with alternative data vendors? Um, first off, I should mention that uh, uh, these comments are all my own and, and not right. those of my employer, but um, I would say we've seen maturation in the space where a lot of firms, you know, weren't, um, that this is some kind of exhaust data that they started selling to this industry and were a bit surprised by the types of questions and the intensity of questions that they would get from um, um, companies in the, the financial sector. And I think now there's a much greater understanding that that is a large part of the process. And so I, I think it, it's been um, in many ways a good thing that vendors are now um, more familiar with this process. They expect it, they're more receptive to it. And I think that that's just the, the outgrowth um, of this industry maturing. Right. And at Revelio, are you, or did you have to change your processes, or are you, do you see this as a maybe as an advantage even because you're sort of a, a you know bigger vendor and therefore you have the scale to 
have compliance covered by dedicated folks and that sort of thing? It's a really interesting question. I mean, in some ways, we are the beneficiaries of some of these rulings. Like you mentioned the Q LinkedIn case. That was a really positive um, ruling. Um, there were actually two things that were that were really great there. I mean, number one is that is that the courts found that if you are not logging into a website, you are not bound by a site's terms of service. You're not bound by robots.txt. You know, the, any data that you can see on an incognito browser is public information. Mm. Uh, another thing they found, which was interesting, is that circumventing or even solving CAPTCHAs is not an issue. And that was, that was a bit of a gray area because you technically are misrepresenting yourself. And for information that you gather through misrepresentation, you know, are you allowed to sell that? Turns out you can. So, so circumventing solving CAPTCHAs was, was another thing that came out of that ruling, which was very positive. Um, but I think, I think the fact that we've gotten clarity on the legality of web scraping has, has sort of incentivized um, target, uh, target websites to increase their, the speed bumps in their process. So it's become more costly to web scrape. And I think it is a barrier to entry. I think the fact that we're, we're you know, a, big, a big alternative data provider is an advantage. You know, if, if I'm thinking, um, you know, if we could afford the costs that we're spending now, you know, three, four years ago, there's no way. I think, I think it's not a good environment for new, new alternative data entrants, which is unfortunate. All right, Sam, I, want, yeah, I wanted to get your thoughts on this too, but I also wanted from you specifically to understand the problem of sort of due diligence in the context of your know, private data and secure computation. It seems like it's a harder problem to solve. Like the due diligence process seems to be just a more difficult process if, if, if there's no access to the underlying data. I think there's, there's a lot to unpack in, in that question. Um, even prior to some of these rulings coming out, we are a very reputation-focused organization, again, as a pension plan, and so our legal and compliance teams have always been quite risk-averse when it comes to data, and when we look at data sources that might be considered um, particularly private, we, we will pressure test those. So when we are buying data from a vendor that says it's been appropriately aggregated or appropriately on anonymized, we will test that and try and see, can you actually re-identify individuals from the data? Because you can't really have blind trust in the technology that's been put in place. Um, and this is actually one of the reasons why we're keen on the, da the data privacy and data security technology, because it does allow you to derive insight from data with less risk, because you're never actually onboarding the data into your own system. So all of the computation actually happens either um, on the other data owner system or in a combined sharded way, in which case you never actually have access to the full data set and then the risk is minimized. But as you mentioned, Ruben, kind of the diligence is difficult because you never see the data. And there's two challenges to that. One is investors are used to getting their hands on the data and getting, getting dirty, um, and they're no longer able to do that. So they have to be much more hypothesis driven when it comes to the analytics they're doing. A second piece around understanding and trusting the data requires more communication with the data owner um, and some sense of what are the patterns you hope or expect to see um, coming out of that data source. I think this is gonna be a, a change management problem and a technique problem as we start to identify kind of how do you actually leverage these data sources effectively when you can't really see what are the null values, what are the gaps in the data, where are the potential issues that you would otherwise uh, view when you're actually doing all of your initial data discovery. Um, so we're still addressing a lot of these challenges in our exploration. Right. Yeah, because it seems to be like in the app Annie case, I mean, if you had some machine learning algorithm sitting on top of the data and you weren't, it wasn't really clear whether, you know, that algorithm was using the private data or the aggregated data, they could sort of say, well, you know, we don't know. It's, it's the, you know, we, we didn't make a conscious choice to overstep, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the data that that we were using, and some of this private data is private for, I guess, for a reason, right? And so, therefore, yeah, it's sort of tough for me to see how you how you overcome that in a due, in a due diligence process. But um, you're saying you're you're working on it. It's work in progress. It's a work in progress. I think 
um, we're able to learn a little bit from the other industries that are a bit ahead of us here. So looking at some of the data networks that are being developed when it comes to uh, healthcare and patient data or banking data and see how they're, they're addressing some of these challenges. A big piece of it is the, the, the trust in building a network. So leveraging your relationships to bring other parties into the network uh, to build kind of a trusted conglomerate and not just kind of letting any old person with data in, into the network. So I do think you, you need to have a little bit of um, careful consideration of, of who you allow into the network and who is providing data because everyone is a little bit at risk if you don't have trust there. Right, okay. All right, so uh, moving, uh, changing gears a little bit, and this is more for the, for the allocators on, on the panel. So, so how, does that, how does a manager differentiate him or herself when it comes to alternative data? Is it a matter of sort of having a platform to really sort of efficiently and quickly be able to ingest and evaluate new data sources, or is it more about the sort of the thought process that goes into, you know, I want to have an answer, find an answer to a particular question, and I, I'm going to go source the data to answer that question, and, and that's how you're successful, or maybe, or maybe both. Um, what's, your, what's your take on that, maybe, Brian? Sure. You know, I think, um, you know, it's often said that, that the alpha in a lot of these data sets decays to, uh, to near zero, if not zero. As more um, as more of your competitors ingest it as well, and I think that that's true in a certain sense. But a, another way to look at it is, you know, everyone gets the same income statements, balance sheets, and cash flow statements. But the way you interpret those and the the questions you ask based on those um, can lead, you know, most people to very different conclusions. And I think of alternative data the same way that if you're trying to do something relatively simplistic, to just use it in a very straightforward way, there's, um, um, th there's not much you'll be able to do there to differentiate yourself. But if you can use it to post questions to, um, uh, or to pose questions, um, or to enrich your understanding in uh, a more nuanced fashion by combining it with other data sets, and really using it to dig into deeper questions, I think it's a very fertile area. And I, I just use the income statement as my uh -huh. analogy. You know, if, if you were trying to, um, um, you know, everyone gets that same data and we all draw very different conclusions. So the, the more of this alternative data that you can get to, um, to supplement that, the more, um, the, the more informed you are of the, the company. And I, I don't think that that's going away. Right. I will say this, this came up in one of the panels yesterday as well, um, where Tony Berkman from Two Sigma was talking about credit card panel data and how a lot of people think most of the alpha has already been eroded from the usage of that data. But that's only really true of the simple uses. If you think about how you can combine that relatively kind of basic data with other data sources, there's still insight to be had. Um, but at the same time, we're continuously looking for new data sources and, and onboarding new data. So to your question, Ruben, we do a little bit of both. Um, we've tried to develop a relatively strong kind of engineering platform to ingest and test data quickly to see if it's additive, uh, primarily trying to understand if it's in any way orthogonal to the data we're already using. So when you already have a mass corpus of data, you're building models off of um, finding new data sources that are adjacent to that and provide new insight can be, can be quite challenging. Um, and, and doing that with speed requires either a lot of resources or uh, good engineering capabilities and partners. So we also work with some external organizations that help us test data additivity before we onboard it ourselves. Right, okay, and then for the, you know, turning that question to, to the vendors, how, how do you stay relevant in, and how do you avoid this risk, I suppose, of your data becoming commoditized and less valuable over time? Like what's the, What's the approach there to, to evolve with, with the market as a, as a single vendor? Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in. I, I think there's really, there's really two ways that I think about this. So on the one hand, you know, it, the, the, the potential for a data set to erode in value is based on how, how rich it is and how high dimensional it is. You know, if you're just looking at pictures of cars in parking lots, like that's one metric, you know, that, that can, the market can get to know that metric and incorporate it into their analyses 
pretty quickly. But the richer the data, you know, the further you can slice and dice things, the more, the more value you can get. So that's, that's kind of one, one lens. Another, another thing is that in some ways, you know, financial markets are pretty sophisticated and capital is allocated relatively efficiently, but in other ways, in other ways there, there's, a lot, there's a lot left wanting. So, so here's an analogy for you. Imagine you're, you're going to buy a car and you take the car to a mechanic. And imagine the mechanic can only look at the speedometer of the car. Ridiculous, right? I mean, you, you'd, want the, you'd want the mechanic to look under the hood, look at the engine and really understand the inner workings. But in some way, you know, financial investors have historically been closer to the mechanic who just looks at the speedometer. We look at outcome metrics, um, proxies for performance. You know, like you mentioned, the income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flows, these are all indicators of performance. But in order to really understand a company, you really do need to look under the hood and look at the engine. And the engine of a company, I mean, that's the people, that's the processes, the product. And, you know, we are very new to this. You know, I don't think, I don't think investors have been analyzing people and employment until just a few years ago. But, you know, any CEO will tell you that's the most important thing to understand about their business. So there really is a big gap in how investors understand companies and, and how companies can be understood. So I think, you know, maybe we can get there, but, you know, I, I don't think we're close. I think we're maybe, you know, 20, 100 years away from, <laughs> from getting to a point where, where companies uh, are really understood as deeply as they, they can be. Sir. Right, from our perspective, we're a very product-focused fo company, and we're in a space where, you know, the, the data sets that people want to use are changing. The questions are changing, the data sets are changing. There are certain data sets that have become commoditized, um, and then there's niche areas that, you know, uh, not everyone necessarily is aware of. Um, so we get, we, with our customers, uh, you know, and we have all the largest hedge funds and, you know, a, lo uh, a lot of the biggest research groups and in investment managers as customers, they'll call us up and say, we need this, and the next day we'll have it live, right? It's because we have the product that can handle the CAPTCHAs or handle the, you know, whatever the blocking is or the technical complexity, we can point, click, deploy, and scale. Um, a data collection operation. So our focus is very much on the product, whether we're licensing our software or delivering bespoke um, custom data services. Um, our focus is on speed to market accuracy and compliance. Great. All right, with that, uh, we're out of time, but this was a fascinating discussion, so uh, give it up for the panel. Oh. I wanted to say one one more thing, which is that the the next project that we're doing um, at uh, on the Alt Data Council at FISD um, is uh, the technologist's role in compliance. So anyone who wants to get involved, just get in touch with Tracy Schumpert. All right, all right. Give it up again for the panel.